Okay, so I'm going to follow directly on from there and talk about some of these issues with cognitive impairments with space and time and numbers that Ed mentioned and start to think a little bit maybe about how we can even begin to uh, fix some of these things. Um, so <clears throat> space and time are, are very abstract concepts that have a scale to them but no actual values. If I ask you how much space is in this room, it's sort of a weird concept unless you start to put numbers on them. Um, and so what we do is we, we, we develop, as we, as we are children through early development, we, measure, we develop these mental units that we can think about to break things actually uh, up into, into concepts that we can actually think about. So we have to learn how much is an inch or a second or a mile or a minute. Those terms don't really exist. We kind of construct them and lay them onto space so that we can think about them. And in fact, the reason we invented numbers was to talk about how many of these things we have. So that's the whole purpose for having numbers. They're really a language for talking about space and time and, of course, how many objects there are. So the question then is, what if your mental units don't match um, the real aspects of space? If they don't match onto the real world, it's going to be very hard for you to think about what these concepts actually mean. Um, so your space estimates will be wrong. How far away is that thing? How, how big is that thing compared to something else? And your time estimates will be wrong. How long did that take? Are we there yet? Um, you know, and those kinds of questions, which you're all used to hearing. How long till we do this thing? Is it my birthday tomorrow? Um, all those kinds of questions, okay? And so this is what I think explains quite a lot, but not all, obviously, of the cognitive impairments we're dealing with, primarily focused on the kinds of impairments that Ed was just talking about. If this is true, then we have the beginnings of an explanation. If we know what's wrong, then we'll know how some, some ideas about how to fix it. You can't fix something until you can explain it. And excitingly, I think we're almost ready to try. So let me tell you, walk you through some examples of my uh, proposed explanation and then some of the ideas about how we might deal with the solution and then tell you where, we, where we're heading. So as Ed just, I'm going to skip over this very quickly. So as you mentioned, there's been a lot of focus in the disorder on performance IQ with these kinds of issues that he mentioned and often called nonverbal disorder. It's a, great it's a great description, but what is the explanation of it? Okay, so he gave you this beautiful description and how you can use it to analyze what's going on and, and maybe suggest uh, interventions, but why is this happening? Okay, so I tend to like to talk about how does the software work and what does the hardware do and what, and what data gets processed. So you can think about this very much like a computer. Um, and there's really two main ideas that might explain this. One of them is this notion of reduced resolution in space and time. So don't get scared about these notions. I'll explain them in pretty simple terms. Um, if you have a digital camera, this will all make sense to you. And developmental changes in brain structure and connections. So that I think these two things together, the hardware is changing in a certain way and the software is changing in a certain way. And if we can get a handle on both of these things, it might tell us how we can move forward with not only an explanation but potential interventions. So let's just talk about this for a minute. A representation, any kind of a representation, whether it's a picture on a computer screen or a brain image or something else like that, is a configuration of elements. And these elements have a given size and an orientation and a color and an intensity. So we're all very familiar now with digital images on our cameras, on our phones, on our computers. And we talk about these little elements as pixels. They're called pixel elements. That's what picture elements. That's why they're called pixels. Okay. And so the size of these elements have a certain... This, these elements are called grains. Uh, or, and so you have a granularity or a resolution of these things. Okay. And so if you have larger and therefore fewer of those grains to make up the same picture, so if, you have, if each one of them is much bigger than somebody else's, you're going to have fewer of them fitting into the same picture. If you imagine two identical pictures, one from a 1 megapixel camera, one from a 10 megapixel camera, you've got 10 times as many units to make up the same picture. Each little tiny one is going to represent a much more focused piece of information than one of those bigger, clumsier ones. Okay, And so... If you have fewer and, and, and larger of these, your resolution for thinking about space and time will impact the mental computations you can do. So if I ask you to take a one megapixel, uh, a picture from a one megapixel camera and compute whether two, two images or two pieces of that picture are bigger than one other, you know, is one person taller than somebody else, you zoom in and you lose it very quickly. But if you go in and you do it with a 10 megapixel image, you can be absolutely certain which of the two people is taller. Okay, so the kind of computations your brain can do if the resolution is different will be affected. And so if you have a mental image that's grainier, like in a digital camera, then you're going to have 
a lower resolution of these mental pictures, the things that your brain is thinking with. And therefore, it's going to be much harder to discriminate differences. Is this bigger or smaller? Did it take less time or more time? Taller or shorter? Further this way than that way? All of the things that we know are difficult. Okay, so I'm going to ask you, I like to do audience participation things. I'm going to ask you to focus on this side of the screen over here. You'll see a cross, and I want you to fix your eyes on it and don't move them, okay? Whatever you do, don't move your eyes. You ready? Okay, look at that cross. Okay, now I'm sure you're aware there's some other things on the other side of the screen. They're vertical bars. Would you like to yell out how many there are without moving your eyes? Four. Oh, there's a consensus for four. Go have a look. Okay, so what happened was I locked your attention down here, and attention has a lowered resolution as it goes out to the periphery. And what happened was, because these things are very indiscriminate, with that lowered resolution attention out on periphery, they crowded together. And so you really couldn't tell. Let's do it again. Okay, look up here now. Okay? In that gray circle is a letter. Anyone know what it is? Q. Q, very good. All right, now one more time. Look down here. What's in the circle? Notice how much more difficult it is to get hold of that cue than the one we had before, because it's crowded, okay? So what happens is when resolution is reduced, things crowd together, and you lose which one is which, and you can't do that computation anymore, okay? So it's like having, I've got this uh, ruler in my brain for space, but, you, but someone with a deletion may have this ruler. They can measure some things, but they can only really be sure of bigger differences. The small ones elude people. Essentially, in a way, like you have a clock that tells time accurately, but what if some of the stuff is missing? Okay, you can only tell very large quantities being different from one another. So how do we know this is true? Well, we do lots of experiments, and I'm going to have you do most of them, um, asking the kids to, to come up with different answers. So in this one, you have to tell whether Kermit the Frog is close to the Fozzie Bear or, or Miss Piggy. Okay, and it's pretty clear he's right in the center right here. Who is he closer to this time? That's very easy. What about this one? So notice it took him a bit longer and people are not quite so sure. What happens is when Kerman is right at one end or the other, or right near this in the center, it's very easy to do. But when you get into this fuzzy zone, it's much harder. So what happens is people, so this is all data from children from 7 to 14 years of age. So there's no error at either end from either typical developing kids or kids with a deletion, and very little error in the middle. But in that middle area, you, the accuracy only goes up at a much bigger distance. So the kids with the deletion need a bigger difference before they can see the difference. Their resolution for space is worse. Okay? So they have a reduced ability to discriminate uh, until it gets to be a bigger difference. Okay? Um, Stefan Elias, who's mentioned before in his lab, has shown exactly the same phenomenon with time. So you ask to hear a sound and then and then another sound and tell which one was the bigger. And they were, they were um, changed by only 10 milliseconds. And how big did the difference have to be could the, till the t kids could tell they were different from one another? Well, the kids with the deletion in here in red had to have much bigger thresholds, whether it was auditory presented or visually presented. So they had to have a much bigger difference before they could say that duration was longer than the other one. Okay? So you can see that big difference there. So again, there's an increased threshold and, but not everything is worse. And the point is, since not everything is worse, we can focus on the things that need intervention. So here's a really fun one. I'm going to show you now um, a great little thing we do. And um, I want you to follow these little planets, okay? So this is what we do in our MRI scanner with the kids and also in the lab. So this is actually what's called a passive trial. First of all, you just have to watch these planets moving around. That's a pretty easy thing to do. Now, in a moment, they're going to stop and three little green aliens, uh, everything is about spaceships in our lab because we pretend the MRI scanner is like riding in a spaceship. So three little aliens will appear. They'll hide behind the planets that will flash, and then you have to follow them. You ready? Here we go. Don't lose those three. Off we go. Uh, there's generally a lot of giggling at this point because people think, I can't do this. Okay, now when it stops in a moment, there'll be a question mark, and all you have to do is tell me, was that one of the ones hiding one of the aliens or not? See, it's actually not that difficult, but it really drives <laughs> it really drives your spatial and temporal cognition very hard. It's designed, the task designed to do that. 
So what happens when we do this? Well, you can actually model quite how many objects an individual person is, is actually being able to track. I won't bother getting into how we do that, but we can estimate what the capacity is, okay? So here is the actual number of targets, one, two, three. And here are typical kids in blue and the kids with the deletion in pink, and that will be the colors through the rest of the talk almost completely. And what you can see is when you do this slowly at 30 frames per second, which is, we, you just saw 60 frames per second, which is quite fast. You can do it slower too. The slower you do it, the few chances you have for the objects to interact, so there's less crowding, okay? So the faster it is, there's more potential crowding, the harder it becomes. Typical kids who are 7 to 14, we estimate them to almost, almost completely accurately represent one object when there's one. They're about 10% below when there's two, or between 5 and 10% below depending on the speed, and about the same when there's three. Now kids with the deletion at the slow speed are just about the same as typical kids, at about 0.9, about 10% off. But as they get to two, they're down 20% off, and by the time they get to three, they're nearly 40% off. And when you speed things up, it really gets bad. So this suggests that crowding is much worse and the capacity goes down as it gets more complicated. So there are things that are relatively unimpaired, but as you increase the difficulty and the complexity and the crowding, things get worse. So that shows that handling space and time is more complicated under more difficult circumstances. What about this one? Well, in the lab, we have the kids compare two bars with one another. And of course, this is pretty easy. Which is the bigger of these two? Sometimes we do it with numbers, which is the, more la the larger value of these two. And you vary the difference between them. And it's much easier to confuse two values when they're close together. I often do this funny thing. I say to people, where is the number one? And very often, people will point right out in front of them. Where's the, where's the million? People tend to point out here. We tend to think of numbers going off in this direction. The bigger they are, the further away they are. So the closer they are in mental space, the more confusable they are. And you can find this to be true in animals and people because people actually represent them sort of in this way. Okay? So what happens is, this is the difference between the two sizes, a difference of one or two or three all the way up to seven. And, you can, and this is the, the performance measured in a blend of speed and accuracy. So typically developing kids sh slow down and are much less accurate when the distance is very small, just one, but they very quickly even out when, when the differences get a little bit bigger. The kids with the deletion show an enormous slope of needing to have a much bigger difference before they can see the difference, which is consistent with everything else I already showed you. Until we get out to here, where they're actually producing the pretty much the same performance, though a whole lot slower. Now, the interesting thing is we know when we simply ask them to give a response that doesn't load these spatial and temporal systems, they can do it at exactly the same speed. So even though they are not um, doing any worse with this, they're still going a whole lot slower. It shows that the system is somewhat impaired. So you can see this, it's a very big difference, again, that the small differences are impaired, the big ones are not really impaired, even though they're slowed down. Again, I think because of this mental resolution of this representation of space and time. Now, interestingly, not everybody is impaired at this. So this is a plot of the slope. In other words, how steep was that slope? So when the slope is very shallow, and it's small positive slopes, you're doing very well. And as it gets more negative, it's getting steeper like this. And this is, uh, this is, well, we don't need to worry about too much about this, but the point is, the worse you're doing, the further are you down, you're down in this direction. And notice that the 20Q deletion kids are in, are in pink and the typicals are in blue. Almost all the typicals are up here doing very, very well. But some of them are down here, but look, there's lots and lots and lots of kids with the deletion um, up here. So well, lots of them are doing just fine, but not everybody. So there's a real variability, and the question is who's, ver who's doing worse, why, and how can we move them? When it gets to the easier task, where there's a big difference, um, then, uh, so this is, well, actually, this is really the same thing. It's just really showing we can, we can do it several different ways. The point is that um, you're getting very much uh, the same thing. Now, if you actually look at this with the easy version of the task, where it's, the differences are big, then pretty much there is no difference between anybody. So it does show that not everybody's impaired and, and all of the kids with a deletion are doing better. Okay. I'm going to move on. So the two questions are what in mind and brain allows some kids to perform like typically developing kids and can we make this happen for those who are impaired? Okay, so that's an important set of questions to ask. Now what about making your way through space generally? Because it turns out that having to navigate space is another problem even if your resolution is lower. So in this experiment, the children see four boxes on the screen and they have to look at this little diamond in the middle. And what happens is 
either one of two things happen. We call this, there's, we call this the exo and the endo, and I won't bother explaining why, I just take those names. So in the exo task, this box up here flashes, it changes color, so it draws your attention very automatically to it. So this is just a, res a very sort of almost reflexive move of your attention to that space. In the other one, half of the, uh, the, the diamond turns into a white arrow and your, direction is, is, uh, your attention is directed in this one. So this is like a volitional controlled movement of attention. This is, oops, something in the world flashed, I need to pay attention to it. And then what happens is a little alien appears in one of the boxes. And this is called a valid cue because he appears right where your attention was drawn. There's also an invalid cue which, when it goes off in the other direction. And you have to disengage your attention and move it. So the question then becomes, are both of these things impaired, moving your attention from one place to another when you have to work with a, a not useful cue? And is there a difference between them? And the difference is very striking. So again, the typical kids are in blue. The kids with the deletion are in pink. And this exo condition where you had to just respond to something that flashed um, is, is dotted lines. And the endo condition where you had to make up your mind to move and navigate under your own steam, as it were, is in the solid lines. It always takes longer to respond to, um, to where I'm told you, you look here and now look here. That's what's called the invalid cue. So they always go up. But notice that there's really no difference between the kids with the deletion or the typical kids when you, get, when you flash the object out there in the world. But when you make them go find it themselves, there's a really enormous difference, whether you do this quickly or slowly or vertically or horizontally. So the point is that a, a cue in the environment is actually very easily used by a child with a deletion. They're not really impaired there at all. But if you say, go find this thing in the environment, it's much, much harder for them to do. So again, there's an environmental support that is an immediate implication of some of our experiments. It also says that there's an impairment only in the volitional, making up your mind to move attention, but not in the reactive search where you have to find something in the environment because it gave you the cue. So there's good guidelines for maybe some supports that can be used. It implies that some things are quite typical and others are not, so there may be differently impaired circuits. Now, why is this important? It's important because the very, I never talk about math. Well, people always say I talk about math. I never get close to math, but I do talk about numbers. So, the first important thing you need to try to understand numbers is we often use spatial search and spatial attention, like this moving around in space, to find where attentional things really are. Okay. So here's an example. I have another task for you to do. Yell out as quickly as you can how many green boxes there are on the red square. Ready? One, two, three, go. Okay, that's really easy, huh? Okay. Ready to do it again? Here we go. One, two, three, go. Okay, that's silence was the sound of attention being shifted. Okay, what some, what you probably did was you probably went something like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or you grabbed the group of them. Okay, three, four, five, six, seven, something like that, right? I bet, I bet nobody went one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and got lost. So that's cognitive control, that's working memory. You have to search in an organized fashion. If you can't move attention around in a volitionally controlled way, you're going to get lost. And notice, if you're going to have hypergranular things that merge together, these two might look like the same thing. So you'd expect there's mistakes to be made here, but not here. This is attentionally dependent, it's going to depend on that resolution. This is not. What do we find? We find that where there's very small numbers, one or two, there is no difference in speed or accuracy between kids with a deletion and typically developing kids. They go just as fast and just as accurate. But as soon as you have to use spatial attention, they move out and they start to make a lot of mistakes and they get slower and slower and slower. And interestingly, the typically developing kids in this range undercount, so that the, the mistakes made are generally plus one or minus one. If you see five things, they say four or six. It's almost exactly 50-50 for the typically developing kids. It's 70% at least for the 20 deletion kids. They undercount. They stop short, which suggests, again, that's consistent with this resolution being reduced because two things might look like the same thing. Now, if you're trying to learn the concept of five, you need to know that there is this many things that make five. Well, if this many things is sometimes this many things and sometimes this many things, sometimes this many things and sometimes this many things, it's pretty hard to know what five means. Right? So this resolution is going to make it difficult. So the question then is, you know, what can we learn from all of this stuff? The point is that I think, it's, I think that it tells us how the representations and therefore the data that the programs are processing have changed. And then we can look at maybe what, what might be there in the brain that suggests how things have changed. And those might point us to interventions that we can use. Okay? So let's talk about the brain. Now, 
I'm going to talk about the brain. Don't get too obsessed with the details. It's complicated. It's technical. All I want to show you is there seems to be a pattern emerging that makes some sense. Don't worry about all the particular names of things. I'll help you through it. But just let me show you a couple of important things. There are very well-defined brain circuits that in typical people um, and in typical animals seem to process spatial and temporal information. The reason I keep going on about typical is that when you have a neurodevelopmental disorder that's genetically defined, you're starting with a different system. It's building a different solution to the world. There's no particular reason why that part of the brain should do this thing because you've built a different way of using your brain in the world. But nevertheless, this gives us some hypotheses. So these have been very well defined in mature animals and humans, and many of these components are atypical in the developing brain in the deletion. So it looks to me like the critical ones are very early developing what are called subcortical regions. So the modern part of the brain is this cortical region that's that, that you see when you see all those nice crinkly pictures that, that Ed showed you. But the brain tends to develop from the middle outwards, and there's some very subcortical regions, very, very old parts of the brain we share with most of the animal kingdom that, that have a lot of important roles in spatial and temporal information. Most animals find their food by using spatial and temporal information. They need to know where to look and for how long. Okay. So that's a very important part of the brain we share with, with animals. So what my idea is that these are, are developing atypically early on and maybe under some more genetic control. And therefore, these, these cortical networks that we've all talked about with the parietal lobes and the frontal lobes and things that Ed showed you may be the result and not the cause. Okay. That over developmental time, these things are developing subcortically. So in other words, these early developing subcortical regions put, put out an atypical output, and that means that you can't really build the right circuits for weaker, for, you end up with weaker circuits for space and time and, uh, and numbers. And therefore, they should be the targets, the connectivity between these should be the targets for intervention, okay? Because connectivity can be changed. So let me give you some examples real quickly. So all I want you to know is that there are some Th there's various areas here, uh, the chordate and the putamen, these are called the basal ganglia, and also um, the, uh, the medial cerebellum and the, the, the pulvinor, which is part, part of the thalamus. These are sort of right down the middle of the brain. These are the ventricles, so we're looking kind of a slice right through the middle of the brain, low down in here. And these are things where human adults were asked to think about time compared to a control condition or pitch compared to a control condition, and these are all areas that are lighting up, okay? So these are consistent with those areas. And also, another set of experiments are showing that when you get spatial neglect, when your brain gets damaged from a stroke, and you can't deal with space anymore, and very often you can't deal with time or numbers anymore, that's usually been associated with the parietal lobes and the frontal lobes. But it's also been shown that if you damage those very same areas, this is the basal ganglia again, and here is the, here is the, um, here is the, the back of the thalamus, then the amount of... So these were adults who had brain damage, and the ones who had spatial neglect, in other words, couldn't deal with space, um, had more damage in those areas. So the argument would be, even though it shows up in those cortical areas, it starts from the subcortical areas. Now, quite a few years ago already, we published some data showing that most of the changes, this is the amount of gray matter in the brain, where it's lower in kids with a deletion than typical developing kids. And it, you can see that it's all down the middle of the brain. Here's the brain from the side, from the back, and from the top. And it's mostly in the back of the brain and in the middle. Now, since the brain develops from the middle outwards, and down here is where the stuff is happening, that's relatively consistent. We've also just submitted a paper showing there's a phenomenon called the, the cavum septum pellucidum. So between the two ventricles in the middle of the brain, it's exactly like your nose. You have two cavities with a septum down the middle. And those cavities are filled with fluid, and they, that's called the cerebrospinal fluid, and it, and it serves to nourish the brain and hold it in shape. And that space is very large, like this, early on in development, and it closes up over time. So by the time you get to sort of early childhood, that space shouldn't be there anymore. And so, uh, so there, in this case, there's no space. Here's a very small space. You can barely even see it. Here's a space that's actually rather longer. Here's a rather longer one even still, and here's an enormous one, okay? Now, what we found is that, in fact, 80% um, of the typical kids had a completely normal um, uh, CSP or didn't have one at all. There was no space. But 36% of the kids with a deletion had an abnormal one. And 24, almost a quarter of them, had one of these very large extreme ones. Now, this doesn't mean to say when you see this, it didn't correlate with IQ. There's no immediate 
clinical thing saying, oh, you know, if you have that, then you're in serious trouble. What it means is it's a sign that the brain didn't develop very typically, and so the circuitry in the whole structure of the brain is going to be different, pointing to the fact that, again, the middle of the brain is a place where you're going to see these early things not developing quite right. One other quick one I want to show you. Um, I'll skip over this, but this pulvinor in the back of the thalamus is a very important root of the attentional system. It's a very difficult one to measure. That's actually it right there, that little gray matter patch you can see. If you wanted to actually draw that one and measure it, it's very difficult to do because no one can see where the boundary is. But we use a different kind of imaging called diffusion tensor imaging to find that boundary very clearly. And then we can actually measure it quite accurately. And, and Heather Shapiro, my graduate student, has been working on this. And we found something very interesting. That that area that, that was the same one that showed up in spatial neglect is considerably smaller in kids with the deletion. Not everybody, but as a group. And more so on the right than on the left. And the right side of the brain does tend to typically deal with spatial information, of course, as, as Ed pointed out. And you don't need to worry about, oh, well, I actually took that out, so you don't, really don't need to worry about it. But it does correlate with performance on those spatial attention tasks. We found very similar things with the hippocampus which is another part of that circuitry that's involved in spatial reasoning. I'm just going to skip over this. We don't need to go into details. And the middle of the cerebellum, which, which Ed also mentioned. But again, mostly through the midline of the brain. So these are many midline structures, very heavily identified with space and time, that seem to be atypical in these kids. And we've been focusing much more on the cortex. So what goes on with the cortex? Well, what we can do is we can do a different kind of imaging, and I don't have time to teach you all about this kind of imaging, but we can do a different kind of imaging. Well, we can measure the amount of the, the directionality and, and the amount of flow of water. Now, water is, there's a lot of water in the brain. It's trapped in the individual uh, uh, molecules of, of tissue in the brain. And when you have white matter, which is wrapped around connective tracks, so if you have you know, f fiber tracks connecting computers together, they're all, they're all wrapped in plastic to get the connectivity to go through, the insulation, right? And the human brain is like that too. So when you have a big fiber track connecting place A and place B, it's wrapped in something called myelin, which you may have heard about, or white matter. And it connects the signal. Or it actually con helps conduct the signal. So when you have a lot of connectivity, the water is trapped as if it were in a drinking straw. Okay, so if I drop a drop of water into a, into a cup of water, the water will flow in every direction, but if I put a drinking straw in and drop it into there, it can only go up and down. So we can measure in the X, Y, and Z directions how much flow there actually is. All I want to point out to you is that we found four locations where there were completely opposite patterns, where the connectivity to the immediately surrounding cortex was much higher in typical kids than it was in, 20, in kids with a 22Q deletion. It's like having a, a freeway that goes from point A to point B, and you want to get off to go to the store or something, but all the exits are missing. So you really can't use that cortex. And those four areas happen to be in very typical frontal parietal circuits for, that are associated with spatial attention. So it suggests that I think this is the consequence that these changes are happening over developmental time, and the, the connectivity and networking for these important networks is getting somewhat compromised. Now, why is, why is that important? Ed just showed you, and this also correlated very highly with the performance on those tasks. Ed just showed you that one of the biggest changes throughout the developing brain is white matter. Okay? It changes all the way into early adulthood. So if we can change patterns of connectivity, um, then we can maybe change this outcome, so knowing what the target would be. Okay? So that tells us that maybe we can actually use interventions that can target this process and actually change the, change the outcome that we're looking at. Um, so one of the most recent things we've done, and I see uh, Sid, my new postdoc in our lab, back, back here, and he's done some, some really exciting new work here. We've looked at the gyrification of the brain in kids with the deletion. So what that means is, as Ed showed you, when the brain is very small and very young, it's pretty smooth, and it gets wrinklier and wrinklier as it goes on. The reason is you're packing more stuff in there. You have to increase the surface area. So the wrinklier it gets, the more surface area there is. And there's a theory that the more two areas are connected together, they pull together tighter, and that pops up that gyrus, as it's called, that bump, and pulls down the sulcus or the valleys. So it's an, it's an indication of how much connectivity there is and how much gray matter there is, and you get a more complicated surface. 
When we measure that gyrification over the whole surface of the brain, this is about 40 kids with the deletion and 40 typically developing kids, we found two pretty stunning things because this actually regenerates some of our previous results in a completely different way. The first thing is this enormous difference right down the middle of the brain. If you take the brain and you just open it up like that and you look at the inside walls, both of them have this enormous difference, which is quite consistent with what I showed you before. The middle of the brain is developing most atypically all the way through, so it's less complicated. And then if you look on the surface of the brain at the places where the gyrification is least complex, it's actually the exact same places where I just showed you those connectivity differences. You just go straight up to the surface and bingo, we found the same results. So it suggests that that connectivity is changing the whole structure of the brain and this is at an overdevelopmental time. So again, it tells us that this is, a I think, a consequence of an atypical developmental trajectory. And if we know what is going on, I think we do, we can start to target those things. One of the best ways to measure what's actually happening, the way the brain is working as a result, to actually look at connectivity or circuitry in real time, we can't really look at it exactly in real time, but to look at it in close to real time, which is to do functional MRI. So here's that task you did already again, okay? So here's those little aliens shooting around. So what we do is we put the kids in the scan and we have them do exactly this task. And they kind of like it because it's a bit like a video game. And we ask them um, to track those objects. And as I said, it turns on these systems really fantastically. So what you see here, there's the task exactly as you saw it before. What you're seeing here is just some preliminary data. We've got lo larger numbers now. This is from seven typically developing children. And this is their brain with the blue blobs on and eight kids with the deletion. Now this is the front of the brain, this is the back, and you're looking at it from two slightly different angles here. This pattern of, um, of as you can see, this is the parietal lobes back here, and this is the, fr the beginning of the frontal lobes, and these are called the frontal eye fields. And the frontal eye fields always activate heavily in this kind of a task, and the parietal lobes do too. So the blue blobs that you see in the typical kids Here's the back of the brain and here's, here's the front. So here's the parietal area and here are the, the frontal eye fields. This is exactly the same pattern of activation you'd see when you get typically developing adults to do this task. So this tells us that our task is activating what should be the effectively standard network for this task because typically developing kids are doing what everybody else is. It's a very well studied task. But notice what the kids with the deletion are doing. They're activating quite a lot of that task and some of what their activation is doing is very similar. So it's not like they're, and by the way, everybody, all of these 15 kids performed identically on the task in the data that I'm showing you. So it's not that one group was doing worse or better than the other, but there's a whole different response to the brain. They're kind of turning on that network, but a whole lot of other stuff is happening besides. So it's almost like they're using a totally different set of circuitry to achieve the same task. And at this point, they're hanging on pretty well. When it gets more complicated, the circuitry just isn't good enough, right? It's like if you want to go to the store, you can take the bus or you can go in the car. Small amounts of groceries, you're fine. What if you want to bring back some lumber? It's really not going to work. Okay, so when things get really difficult and overloaded, so the question is, how can we kind of beef this up in some way? So we are seeing a lot of consistent things. So let me just try to summarize you. So I've got these new hypotheses, and they may, I'm not saying they do, that's what we're going to do with our next five years, but they may explain what these pro cognitive problems are, why they're happening, and what they're, what they're caused by. These changes can be seen in the parietal and frontal regions, just as we always thought they would be. But I think they result from problems in much more basic circuits that come from atypical development early on towards the middle of the brain. And it's the connectivity of things coming after that that's more challenged. Not all areas of nonverbal function are impaired. I showed you there's this completely typical ability to do things um, with very small numbers. There's a completely typical ability to do things with a reactive attention. And I'd like to spend more time with people like Donna Landsman thinking about how we can take those kinds of results and turn them into advice for teachers and parents about how to use that stuff. That's one of the reasons we do these talks and I put them up on the web so you can kind of go do that. But where, those, where they are uh, impaired, they're not due to general dysfunction. This is not a globally dysfunctional brain. There's some rather specific things going on. So the areas of strength provide us with pathways 
to improved learning in problem areas. We can focus on those essentially as, as our helpers to move us down. So if you know you can deal with very small sets of objects and you can count them just fine, then split big groups of objects into very, very small ones. Make them very distinct from one another and separate them in space and then they won't get confused. So there's a good example. If you want to compare this difference to that difference, have a very big difference and then work down to smaller differences. Don't go the other way. So those kind of things can help. But also, some of these areas in mind and brain could be targets for, for intervention and to generate those improvements. All right, so let me tell you some exciting things. Yippee, we just got news that our next five years of funding has been approved by the NIH. Um, we are going to start in July. We don't know how much they'll cut our budget, but hopefully not very much. Actually, there's $2.6 million of, of funding for the next five years, so uh, we're going to be able to do a lot of work. Um, and what I hope to do is to re-recruit as many of the previous participants to our study as possible. The, the activities that we'll do will be different enough that we can get kids to come back if they're still less than 15 years of age, and that will give us a beautiful free opportunity to look at longitudinal studies, which no one's ever done before, at least in this age group. So if you've been with us before, look out. We're going to be asking you to come back, and if you haven't, we're going to be looking for you to come back. And we have funds to bring you here. It won't cost you to come. Okay. And I'll tell you more about what else we're going to do. So we've done some, that'll give us some very new uh, longitudinal research and we'll test this new hypothesis. And I think it's going to give us some interventions that we're going to do. I'll tell you more tomorrow about interventions. I think we're in a position to start to build interventions. I'll tell you a little bit more about that tomorrow. I, mean, I hate to sort of, you know, I've got to st stick to my timing here. But I think we can use, believe it or not, action-based video games. They're not going to be the first-person shooter video g games you see out there on the market, but they're actually going to be based on those kind of games. And I think those will change the way the mind and the brain works. And so we're going to try to build, a, I think I have finally have a partner, we're going to raise some money and we're going to try to start to do this this year. And also I'll tell you some more about some of our more clinical support and follow-up uh, that we're trying to do for, with telemedicine for people who've participated in our studies so that we can support you at home. And as somebody asked this morning, why don't the psychiatrists and the doctors and the teachers know about this? Well, this is the way we can teach them by getting to them where they live. So that's what we're planning to do too. I'll tell you more about that, all of that tomorrow. So thankful, most of all, to you. If you don't come and bring your kids and help us with this, we can't learn anything and we can't tell you anything. So most importantly, thanks for coming. Um, the majority work I showed you was done by this incredible group of people, some of which are in my lab right now, some are previous members, and some other enormously important contributions from previous members of the lab who've moved on, and other people from other places, and an enormous vote of thanks to the UC Davis Center of Excellence in Developmental Disabilities that's headed by Randy Hargeman and Robin Hansen, who couldn't be here, but without their help, we wouldn't be able to get all of this clinic, clinical support done. So with that, I think I'm about uh, three or four minutes early, and we can start to take some questions online.